Are you interested in successful marketing tactics that also benefit the communities that your business serves? If so, you have come to the right place. This is the Win Grin Podcast, brought to you by Leagueside, the nation's leading youth sports sponsorship platform. On the show, we talk to some of the smartest minds in marketing and brand building about marketing and growth strategy and hear inspiring stories about how they got to where they are today. Get ready to learn and be inspired. Here's your host, Evan Brandoff. Hello and welcome to the Wingrin Podcast. I'm your host, Evan Brandoff. Today, we welcome Abe Kmark onto the show. Abe is the CEO and founder of True Made Foods, and he is on a mission to help save American family occasions by making them healthy again. Let's get into it. Abe, welcome to the show. How are you? And thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Honored to be here. Really. Yeah, thank you so much for for joining us. Uh, we are a household that absolutely loves the True Made products. Uh, thank you. And That's great to hear. See the sign right behind you. Uh, <laughs> For, for those that aren't familiar, can you tell us about True Made Food? Yeah, so we make a whole line of uh, condiments and sauces, ketchup, barbecue sauces, mustards, uh, hot sauces, sriracha, um, all without the sugar. We cut the sugar out and um, we naturally sweeten our products with real veggies instead. So we use real whole fruits and veggies pureed, cooked into the sauce to give that natural sweetness that you miss. Um, but we take out all the corn, so corn syrup and uh, added sugar. So... Um, so like our ketchup is made with tomatoes, obviously, um, apple, carrots, butternut squash, and then, you know, vinegar and spices. Um, and it still tastes like ketchup. So it reads like a smoothie ingredient, but your tastes like ketchup. You have no idea that you're not eating a regular ketchup. It's key. It's true. It's, it, it's, it really is such an amazing product. I, I know you're a big family guy. You got four kids. <laughs> Right, have, right. have you done the the taste test yet? Uh, the blind taste test with with the kids. True made food foods ketchup versus you know other name brand. Uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now, and we wouldn't have this company if my kids didn't love the product and didn't prefer <laughs> it over everything else. Um, what we found, you know, my kids were the ultimate taste testers. My picky eaters at home, and this is the reason I started the company is because like uh, you know trying to feed my kids healthy, didn't want sugar, um, trying to feed them a lot of veggies, you know, basic stuff. Um, but <clears throat> ketchup was a constant in the household that I hated. Like I was trying to get it out because I'm like, I knew it was just red sugar. I mean, it, it's more corn syrup than tomatoes in regular ketchup. And even the organic ketchups are still all cane sugar. Um, it's got more sugar per ounce than ice cream. It's like a dessert, you know, regular ketchup. Um, <clears throat> it's terrible for you. It's like, uh, a serving has four grams of sugar, which is a teaspoonful of sugar. So you imagine you're just pouring, you know, if you've you ever seen kids eat it, you know, they're eating a lot more than a, a tablespoon, which is a serving size. Um, so, yeah, but like, you're not going to stop cooking out, right? You got family and kids, like, you're not going to go to stop going to ballparks or going to lowly cookouts or, you know, going to, uh, you know, Friday night football games where all these things use ketchup and barbecue sauce and so on. And so, and we love going out for burgers. Like nothing that I like more than getting, doing burgers for my kids and stuff like this. So, um, <clears throat> and having fun ways about it, but like ketchup is always there. So I'm like, how, but you know, burgers on their own, it's not that unhealthy. Barbecue on its own is not that unhealthy. It's the ingredients that make it unhealthy, right? It's the ingredients and how it's made. And so, and that's our theory. It's all about whole foods. <clears throat> You probably hear a lot of like, there's so much noise about nutrition and how you're supposed to eat out there and you should be vegan or keto and yada, yada. Um, ignore it all. It's all just whole foods. Eat whole foods, unprocessed foods as much as possible and cut out the added sugars. Added sugars are the, the 90 10, not the 80 mm -hmm. 20, the 90 10 when it comes to eating healthy. Cut out the added sugars and the artificial sweeteners. And that's the easiest thing you can do. Um, and then, you know, eat whole foods. And so that's what we did. We tried to eat create products that were made as close to being as whole foods as possible. And, you know, we don't want to give up the backyard cookout. We don't want to give up trips to the ballpark just because, you know, we're trying to eat healthy. You know, the, we don't have to throw out the grill and start eating kale and quinoa salads outside. Let's, you know, eat real, let's eat just real food, better, buy the better hamburger, buy the better buns and use our ketchup and boom, like you've got a real meal. So you know, that's kind of what we, that's our goal as uh, true made foods to allow America to 
keep <laughs> families to keep these these habits and these processes and like you know because it's not about the event it's not about the occurrence it's just the ingredients that have been put into it over the last 50 years yeah. and that's the thing that we have to clean up and so you know i want my kids to have these experiences and i just want them to take you know, to take the guilt away from it at the same time as a parent. And so that's why we tried to, that's the whole purpose of our company. So, yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> you clearly practice what you preach in terms of being healthy or, you know, uh, it, 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 in good shape, it seems at least o- over zoom. A- 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 have you always been health conscious? What, what, yeah. What's your story yeah. in terms of being health conscious? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's a kind of like a, a slow awakening towards everything. Cause you know, I'm, I, I'm old, I'm a 45 year old man. So I was born in the seventies and grew up in the eighties. And, uh, I, uh, <clears throat> so I grew up, I was lucky that, yeah, I grew up with an Italian mother and we cooked a lot in our family and we, you know, we cooked a lot of home. That's so I, I got the idea for the ketchup is like, we always use carrots as the natural sweetener in our pasta sauce. And we were making pasta sauce like weekly, you know, ragu is a four letter word in our house. And like my parents didn't own a microwave until I went off to college. Like it was just like, um, so we just cooked a lot in our house and we really cared about food. I mean, not to say we didn't eat bad food. Like we still, there was still bad food around and there's a lot of unknowns. Like, um, my parents would still buy juice and things like this, which of course now we know is just as bad as soda. You should not buy, don't eat juice, right? Apple, it's like the apples are good. The apple juice is terrible for you, right? right. It's like, it's pure fructose, goes right to your liver. Um, but, and of course, you know, m- we still ate McDonald's, things like this. It wasn't like a perfect um, upgrade, but we, but I was introduced enough to good food and how to cook. And I was taught how to cook at an early age. And I think that's, the key thing, especially as an oldest, uh, the oldest sibling and both my parents worked all the time. So I was always in the kitchen helping out and always having to make my own food and always make food for my siblings. So, um, I had to learn how to cook and I learned my way around the kitchen as an, um, at an early age. And I think that's key for anybody for really who wants to eat healthy is like just understanding how food is made and making your own food makes a big difference. Um, and so then like when I was in college and then after college, when I was in the Navy, um, <clears throat> you know, I always had roommates who grew up much more on the more on the standard American diet side. And, you know, when I, I had some roommates in Florida, when I was stationed there in Mayport that had, uh, that were very much on the standard American diet kind of grow up, like when I grew up the ground beef diet of like, you know, you know, hamburgers, tacos, pasta out of the jar, like that's it. The three meals that were rotated through their household. And uh, like they were in, we were in our early twenties, this guy, my roommate is struggling with his weight and I'm not, and he's eating much more crap that the time we look back at crap, but he's criticizing what I'm eating because I'm pouring olive oil on everything because I grew up like, so literally I was probably the only like 23 year old who's going buying like huge <laughs> things of olive oil at the time. You know, this is like 2001, 2002. And like, I'm buying like gigantic things of olive oil and like pouring it all over. Like every single meal I ate was like covered in olive oil and usually garlic. And like, uh, and he was like, there's so much calories in that. That's so wrong. And I was like, this can't be right. Like olive oil can't be bad for you. And like the chocolate syrup he's drinking out of the bottle, like you can't, you can't be good for you, right? So it can't be good for you. So um, we, so I just started doing more research on my own and just kind of like slowly kind of over then the next like 10, 15 years. And then I accelerated when I had kids, like really started doing research on like what it is that you need to do to stay healthy. And as I got older too, you know, as you get older, I started thinking more about this and like what you need to do to stay healthy. And I just kind of, it was just always kind of like my background habit. And as a cook too, as somebody who's avid about cooking, like it just kind of felt right that falling back onto like, the way people used to cook, like the way our grandparents cooked and something like that was completely healthy. You know, for a while we were like slamming in the eighties and nineties, like slamming the way our grandparents cooked. Like, like my great grandma on my dad's side is Southern from the Ray, Virginia. And she was a famous cook for in DC for being like, she was, her parties apparently were like amazing because of her cooking. And, uh, she used, you know, always had lard and butter, like, and that was her two secrets of like cooking right there. Right. But didn't use a lot of sugar and anything that wasn't a dessert. And, you know, I, because that's what was expensive, you know, pre-World War II. Right. right. So she cooked, she grew up poor. So she cooked that way, like the way they did in the mountains in, in Virginia. And, 
you know, looking back at this in the way like my mom used to say, it's like only lazy Italians do sugar in their sauce because like in Sicily where her grandparents were from, they had carrots. They grew in the garden. They had carrots all the time, used carrots. You didn't have access to sugar. Sugar was refined. It was expensive. It came from factories. Like, so anything that came from a factory back in the day was you know, extremely expensive. Um, now it's like the opposite. Anything that comes from the ground seems to be expensive mm. and anything that comes from a factory is extremely cheap. Right. So it's probably why our sugar consumption has increased by 200 times since 1850. You know, the average amount of sugar that the, uh, that an American eats has increased by 200 times between 1850 and 2000. Um, how so, does that, and, uh, how does that compare to other countries? I'm not sure, but I'm sure we're leading the way. And then yeah. probably the other English speaking countries are not are shortly behind. Um, England really drove the sugar industry early on. Um, from what I understand, if you read uh, Gary Tobb's book, um, the case against sugar, like, and it, sugar is just like, there are so many things wrong with it. When you look at the history of it, it like it drove the slave trade too. Um, it created slavery, our modern day slavery, or the after the slavery of African Americans, because it was such an awful crop to uh, work on sugarcane um, that they couldn't even get indentured servants to work on it. They couldn't get you know local mm. people to work on it and things like this. So they um, they had to use slaves because it was such an awful job. And so that cre- and then the demand for sugar that was coming out of England at the time um, and created that, I don't know if you remember your elementary school history, but like that, that slave triangle, the trade triangle of like sugar, um, slaves and rum that went from the Caribbean to England and Africa, like back and forth. And so. Hmm. So interesting. Uh, <clears throat> by the yeah, way, my, my, go on about that for Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it. It's really interesting. Uh, my wife and I are watching the Sopranos right now. Uh, and I would say, about 60% of our cooking at home is, is Italian food inspired by, by the Soprano. So I'm jealous that your, your upbringing, it sounds like a incredible time cooking with your mom, you know, making sauce. And, uh, I could see how that would yield you being into health and, 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 you know, wanting to, to create those experiences that you had had at home. Like why isn't everyone using carrots to, to sweeten their sauce? And and why aren't we applying that same rationale to, to things mm-hmm. like, like ketchup? So that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, before we get more into true made foods, your background is, is, is so interesting and, and incredible. Uh, where, where did you, did you grow up in Virginia? Um, I was I was born in DC. I lived in Virginia until I was ten, and okay. then I moved to Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I lived in Brooklyn until I was sixteen. Um, then we moved to Maryland, to the suburbs of DC in Maryland, and I finished um, enrolled in public high school in uh, Maryland and finished graduated from Mer- uh, Montgomery County Public High Schools there. Um, so, Which high school? Uh, uh, Walt Whitman. For real? Oh, that's where my that's wife a- went. Oh no way! Yeah, right. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yeah, really good school. It was amazing public school. Like it was an incredible school. It was a great time. I mean, then to be able to move to Bethesda from Brooklyn at the time, like which was like '93 for me. 1993 was incredible. Brooklyn was not what Brooklyn is now. It was like, uh, and it's weird too because you know I lived there for six years for, in Brooklyn, um, but I never said I was from there. And like when I went to college, I told everybody I was from Maryland. <laughs> Um, I kind of embraced Maryland. I really loved just moving there because um, it was just it was in Brooklyn at the time. You were just constantly uh, afraid, right? You were just like afraid of getting all jumped all the time. Like it was just like you know. And so it was the early '90s, and we, we moved there in the late '80s so when it was still really bad. And, uh, and then you moved to suburban Maryland outside dc and it was just like a little different yeah. pure freedom <laughs> like and my parents didn't care what time i got home they didn't have to worry about me or anything like this it's just incredible like nobody was gonna pull a gun on you it was just like <laughs> fantastic so um but yeah i used to never say i was from brooklyn because uh people back then if you were from brooklyn you grew up in brooklyn and you never left like you were a brooklyn brooklyn person so i'd never claimed brooklyn i always told people when i went to college i told people i was from maryland i claimed maryland um, all that kind of stuff, like from Maryland or DC. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, most recently in the last 10 years, we moved back to the U S like 10 years ago or eight years ago. 
And, uh, you know, I visit Brooklyn now and meet all these people who are like claiming to be Brooklynites and like they moved there like two years ago and, you know, living it's about to be us. Something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's like, I'm like, you're, you've never been mugged. You're not, you're not from Brooklyn. You know? Yeah, exactly. You, not, you don't have an accent. Yeah. You don't have an accent. You don't throw a fucking, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can curse on this podcast. It's okay. <laughs> uh, you don't throw the F bomb in between every other set, every other yeah. word. Like you're clearly <laughs> not from Brooklyn. Uh, so now I feel like I can claim to be more from Brooklyn than the people who live there now, but you know, you're pretty Brooklyn. I could see it. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you went to Vanderbilt, then you joined the Navy. Did, did you always want to, or was that, was that right after school? Yeah, I was, I was, I went to Vanderbilt on an ROTC scholarship. So okay. the, the Navy paid for me to go to school. That was kind of always the plan. Um, in high school, I decided I wanted to join the Navy. So um, I had even talked, looked at it in, into enlisting. And then, but uh, yeah, my parents were pushing me hard on the officer program because they wanted me to go to college, obviously. So they, um, so I, I got into the Naval Academy and I got the ROTC scholarship. And um, I actually turned down the Naval Academy to go take the ROTC scholarship to Vanderbilt, which I thought for me was a really, really good decision, um, personally. Um, I think I, I needed that time to mature in undergrad and make stupid mistakes, uh, you know, and be crazy a little bit, um, you know, free from the responsibility, get that out of my system. So and have life and you realize you, and you're still going to school for free and, you know, and you're still, uh, you get commissioned right after you graduate at the same rate as the academy guys. Well, I um, might need you to, uh, have a conversation with my nephew who has his mindset on going to the Naval Academy. And uh, I, I like the route that you took. So, uh, <laughs> Well, personally, I think for other people, the Naval Academy is great. Like if my kids decide, my sons, if my, my daughter decided to go to the Naval Academy, I'd be totally excited about that because I, I probably don't want them doing what I did in college. So like, <laughs> I prefer Fair. they went to the Naval Academy <laughs> for my kids. And and my wife went to the Naval Academy um, too. So she was a 2000 grad. Um, and we met in the Navy afterwards. And this is just ironic, but it's like one of the reasons I turned down the Naval Academy because at 18 years old, I wanted to go to a school with more girls. And back then, the Naval Academy was like 10% women, um, you know, and obviously, uh, <laughs> and then ironically, 10 years later, I ended up marrying a uh, Naval Academy graduate. That's funny. <laughs> Good. She probably wouldn't have liked me if she had met me when I, at that age. So, so okay. it all yeah. works out. <laughs> yeah. So, so af after the Navy, uh, yeah, you lived abroad for, for quite a bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so I was a helicopter pilot in the Navy station in Florida and then, uh, you yeah, know, deployed a bunch, um, deployed a lot, um, into, for Iraq and for the Iraq war. And then, and we were in the Gulf and then, uh, for my shore duty, <clears throat> after you do a flying tour, you do a shore duty where you're working like in an office, like headquarters type thing. And, um, or you're teaching. Um, and I went to U.S. European Command and I got stationed in England. Uh, so I was stationed at a satellite branch of the U.S. US European Command in England. And uh, so we lived in England, we lived in Cambridge. And then I got my <clears throat> executive MBA at London Business School while I was there. So I did that nights and weekends thing. Um, and <clears throat> got out. And we decided to stay in England. My wife had gotten out at this point and she was doing her grad degree in at LSE as well. Um, <clears throat> and so we thought we should stay in London and, uh, you know, make a go of it since we both got our grad degrees there. And that was where our network or, you know, our potential professional network was. Um, but then the, we got out in the recession hit, like it was like 2008 and it was just like the worst timing ever. Um, so there was no jobs and nobody wanted to hire ex-military people um, at that time. So, and there was no, in 2008, there was no military support for veterans like there is now, um, which is fantastic. Um, so we ended up just uh, working overseas more. So I went to Bulgaria next for my next job. Um, my family didn't come with me for that. My wife uh, moved back in with my parents, moved in with my parents and had my second son because we had two babies at that point. Um, and so I moved, I moved to Bulgaria on my own for um, about uh, eight months. And then, um, then we went to, uh, Doha, Qatar. Um, so my wife got a job that got her over there and, uh, I got, 
I started my own company and it was emerging market focused because that's what I've been working in. So I've worked in emerging market kind of consulting and um, innovation side, like how to start businesses in these, uh, in these markets and worked on infrastructure projects and stuff. And so um, and Doha was just a good location because I could get to Egypt easily. I could get to Ghana easily, um, Uganda, China, places like that that I was doing work in. And uh, <clears throat> I did some work in, you know, set up a company in Doha too and did a startup there as well because things seemed like they were booming at the time. So it was 2010 and, you know, they just won the World Cup and there was a lot of investment in there. So, um, but uh it wasn't as big an opportunity as I thought we thought. So we, we left after three years. We, you know, it worked out well. It was a great experience. Um, we we're glad we were there. Um, <clears throat> it's very dangerous living in Doha, Qatar. Um, not because of like what you think from an American. It's not like a terrorism danger. It's like uh, the drivers will kill you. Like in a second, the traffic is awful. And like, yeah, the driving is insane. Like uh, wow. you're, you're fearing for your life. And we had small kids while we were there. My daughter was born there. And like, you're just fearing, you buy the biggest car possible. Like, so you buy big SUVs and everybody's driving big SUVs. And just because for the safety factor and uh, everybody's driving like a maniac people <laughs> from all over the place. Like uh, you also are, uh, yeah, you're, you're there at the uh, bequest of the, the country too, right? So there's no real loss um, like we know and appreciate here. So literally if the wrong person gets mad at you, you could be in prison and not get out. Right. And the US Embassy can't do anything about it. So that was always like kind of tensile, especially when I was what I was doing. I was working on like some migrant worker projects and things like this that were, you know, could be sensitive issues and things. And so um so and then there was also all these fires. There's so much construction going on and they're doing it very cheaply with cheap labor. The construction was really bad. And so there's like fires and building collapses and problems like that all the time. And so we were like, okay, we got to get out of here at some point or we'll all go crazy or something will get us. So, uh, but it was a wonderful experience. Otherwise, like, you know, we, we had great friends there, um, great local friends, everybody uh, that we still stay in touch with and stuff like that. And the travel was amazing. And just the, the projects we worked on were incredible. So, yeah. It's awesome. Uh, Is True Made Foods available outside of the States yet? No, not yet. Um, we're working on it. Uh, we get inquiries all the time, but you know, it's like everybody's always pretending they're an importer and exporter and you got to look and make sure you're partnering with the right people. Right. Which, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll chat after. I, I know someone that I could potentially introduce you to that I think is legit. You, you'll, you'll, you'll be the judge. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so fast forwarding you, uh, it bothered you that uh, ketchup was so unhealthy. Uh, your kids loved ketchup. Everyone loves ketchup. Uh, and there, it's just so much sugar. So you develop a product that tastes just as good, if, if not better, and has no sugar. Yeah, and we, we actually didn't start with a full no sugar. We started with a low sugar version. So okay. we started with carrots, butter, and squash. And like that... Got, basically, we just tested and tested until we got to a point where we were using half the sugar in a regular ketchup. So like a regular ketchup has four grams of sugar, sugar per serving. We, so we got to a point where it was at two grams of sugar per serving. I thought, okay, that's probably good enough to start. There's no other no sugar ketchup in the market at the time. This is like 2015, 2016. So that was kind of like our, our minimum viable product, right? So to speak. And like, um, so we pushed that out there and, uh, that was the initial kind of product that we went out to market with. Um, what does that look like? You, you have, you have a product, you think it's good. How do you go to the market? Yeah. What's your go to market strategy with, with a product like this? Um, so I can tell you what I did and I can tell you what I recommend for people <laughs> instead. Okay. So what I did, uh, we launched out of an accelerator in New York called FoodX, which doesn't exist anymore, but there was a food accelerator. There was, again, like 2016, there was a lot of money coming into food um, from the tech side and people were getting excited because like the market was shifting. And so I was getting really excited about this idea. Um, and so um, uh, we jumped in full in and they, the, you know, the accelerator was great because it, forced me to do the company full-time which 
I don't recommend doing until you really have a really figured out product for a while, you know? So like, um, <clears throat> but if I hadn't done it full time at the time, I probably, it probably would have faded out. I probably would have gotten a job or something like that and between four kids. And I can't do a startup, a full-time job and, you know, <clears throat> and take care of four kids at the same time. So it, <laughs> It forced me to do it full time, um, and uh, the accelerator did, and they, that gave us an initial like fifty thousand dollars too, which helped like really reduce the the cost. Um, but the idea was, you know, there was all these craft foods coming out of New York City at the time. So my dad lived in New York at the time; he had an apartment there, so I had a place to crash. And we launched out of uh, New York City, and the idea was just we just took the product around to all the different. Um, New York is full of a lot of these small specialty stores, right? Higher end stores where you can just talk to the manager. Italy the and, and yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the smaller ones too, like yeah. Brooklyn Fair and things like that. Yeah. Um, uh, Society Fair in Williamsburg. You know, and so like you, you, <clears throat> you, you bring your, your products in and you, you, uh, and, you know, you pitch it and you give them a free case and then you, know, you go back and you demo it a few times to get customer feedback, talk to people about it. And you figure these are the shoppers who are looking for something new, who aren't um, price sensitive, right? This is. So, um, so that was the test. You know, that was the first year. I was totally just testing the market in these small stores in New York. So I would, you know, drive up to New York or take the bus up to New York, you know, and, and take product around to all these stores, and things like that. Um, delivering it myself, following up with stores myself, um, trying to get paid, you know, things, um, and testing the market that way. Um, <clears throat> I think right now I would tell somebody instead to go online first to do your own, do your website, do your own direct to consumer. <clears throat> Maybe set up Amazon if you understand Amazon. You can do a do a merchant. Um, um, FBM for someone by merchant on Amazon and I drive, but then do events like, uh, um, farmers markets, flea markets, things like that to get people sampling the product and buying it the first time and then getting them to try to reorder online and see how many like follow on orders you get from online. Um, <clears throat> you can go to local stores and things like this. I would not do what I did, which was living in Virginia and trying to sell in New York because that was just like too much on me and my family and everything like that. I was lucky my dad lived there, had an apartment there, so I was able to crash, had some place to crash, but it was just, uh, you know, the commute was just awful. Um, and uh, so I would, you know, go to your local stores, test things out, um, figure out your category really well. Um, that's one thing that we didn't do really well is, uh, so I think the mistakes that we made early on are really the key, which is like one, <clears throat> um, our category is very difficult because it's, it's a slow turn category, right? Naturally, right? So, you know, how many times a year are people buying ketchup, right? Or, or it's like you're buying it. Like, What is the answer to that? Uh, the average household in America buys it 3.3 times a year, right? Ketchup okay. and mustard's like 2.2 or something like that. Um, so, and that's very skewed, right? Because you have single people who never buy it or buy it one once every two years. You know, there's one bottle sitting in their fridge forever, or you have um, families with like five kids like mine who are going through it on a regular basis, you know, buying it almost weekly, right? But <clears throat> so you have these very few shoppers who are buying it a lot. And the problem is, is like those people who buy that product a lot um, for our category, they don't shop in specialty stores and they don't live in New York City, right? Things like that. And they don't live in Brooklyn, right? Because you don't have... Um, Unless you're Orthodox Jewish and you live way up in the uh, alphabet area and stuff like that, you probably don't have eight kids and are living in New York City, right? So, right. Um, or living <laughs> in Brooklyn. So, uh, <clears throat> you're, um, so this is like the challenge that we had with this category. And it took me a while to figure this out, which is like, you know, these special, this route that we took, we were copying other like very artisan, natural food, kind of crafty foods that were coming out at the time, things like this. And they were in different categories where that worked, like coffee, things like this. And it doesn't work well with condiments because ketchup is boring. It's ubiquitous. Uh, and this is what I liked about it. It's boring, ubiquitous. It's, it's suburban, right? It's a suburban purchase. And it's very conventional. The, uh, it's a billion-dollar category in conventional food sales. And it's like a $15 million category in, natural, in the natural channel. 
Hmm. Like, so I mean, you look at like, um, like a conventional store, like stop and shop sells, um, like 50 to $80 million in ketchup a year. Right. And whole foods only sells $12 million of ketchup a year. Right. So if you want to, at the time <laughs> and still, it's a still viable strategy today. If, if you're better for your food, you know, you want to get your first five to $10 million of sale, like in a specific channel or in a specific, um, region. Right. So like if you're selling a kombucha or a jerky or something like this, you know, you just focus on your, your local region, or you just focus on like your whole foods channel if you get into whole foods. Right. And you just try to own that region and try to get up to five, $10 million in sales. And uh, you can't do that with ketchup or barbecue sauces and things like this. Right. Cause trying to become a $5 million brand, just selling through whole foods when whole foods sells $12 million worth of ketchup annually across all their 510 stores. And, you know, for half of that is their private label. Like, you know, that's, that's an amazing amount of marketing and brand awareness that you would have to do to be able to get up to that, um, you know, uh, consumer and it's a <clears throat> slow term product. So, you know, every time you convert a consumer, they're not buying it every week or every day, like with a beverage or a salty snack, like they are buying it then in the next month or three months or four months. Right. So you got to constantly be bringing, if you want to keep driving your sales up, you have to keep constantly be finding new consumers. So it's like the math behind it is totally different, right. For our category. Um, so it's like the two challenges with our categories, it's very slow turn and very conventional focused, which is more expensive to operate in and harder because you're working with big stores like ShopRite or Stop and Shop giant and Safeway, which are more expensive, more difficult to deal with, you know, that kind of thing than other than the small channels and stuff. Like that. So, so, um, so that was the hard part with us is like, we tried to launch in this crafty kind of thing. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't work. And then, and marketing yourself as a crafty ketchup doesn't work in stop and shop. Like it's not, you're not, your product's not going to sell, you know? So right. we had to, we had to pivot our, our branding multiple times away from that crafty look, you know, that we started with, um, to be kind of a more of a bold, more approachable, more conventional. We want to be better for you, but we want to be seen as like an American, big, big American brand that's approachable and better for you. Right. So we had to like balance that out. So so that was like our challenge early on. That's why it took a long time for us to get started to figure it out. Yeah. It's so interesting. And, And a really good takeaway there is, when creating your customer persona, uh, I think a, a, a common misconception is is when creating your your persona, it's like, oh, we want to reach health conscious people, and and not looking at the data behind how much are certain segments of people buying the the certain category. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, and you really got to figure out, and like, like again, like our biggest best customers are people with kids, or people with grills, like backyard grills. And again, like people in New York don't have grills, like they're not cooking out outside, right? And so it's like that. So we need to find so we're in, we're a suburban product, really, at the end of the day, and we need to be in suburban stores, and so and targeting suburban shoppers, which is right. harder, more expensive. They're further apart, you know, harder to reach kind of thing. Uh, so <clears throat> that's like your challenge. If you're developing a product, um, especially a food product or a beverage, you really need to think about like, who's your shopper, who's your buyer, what channel are they on? How are you going to find them? Um, where do they want to buy your product again? Which is why like going online, I think initially is the best thing to do. You find your, find your, if you can get people buying online on a regular basis, at least then it shows like some data, some customer loyalty, be able to figure out who your customer is and what resonates with them too. And like, that was a challenge with us too, is like, um, uh, we're making these products with all these vegetables in them, which is the ultimate selling point. I think most people were mostly convinced. And like when we did a lot of customer interviews, people love the fact that there's carrots and butternut squash in the product, but it's also the biggest barrier to try, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we realized pushing the vegetables first um, just makes people weirded out. And that's the other thing like about a food product is if you want some type of mass appeal, you don't want to be weird, right? You need to be, you need to de-weird your brand. So we are um, 
especially if, like if you're ketchup, right? Because the biggest thing going through a mom's head when she's looking at this ketchup with carrots and butternut squash on it is like, are my kids going to eat this? Or am I going to bring it home? They're going to get pissed off. They're not going to eat it. They're not going to eat dinner. And then this bottle is going to sit in my refrigerator for three months until I finally just throw it out, right? Um, that's what every parent is thinking, right? And then when they're trying to, when they're going through that first thing. And so you need to kind of make it easier for them. So we, we finally got to the point where we were like, all right, the, the veggies are like a secondary thing where we want to, that's how we close the deal. It's the no sugar. And that's where when 2018, we finally and watched the no sugar version of ketchup. We realized we could add apple and completely cut the sugar. And that was really um, game changer. <clears throat> so we, we focused on no sugar first and just like drove the no sugar um, piece of it and got whole 30 certified and paleo certified and things like this, that kind of, and keto certified. So, you know, to really try to like pull in all those channels and, uh, you know, get that social proof going. And so at least there's, we still are up against that barrier because people expect things with no sugar taste bad too, right. As they do normally. Yeah. Um, well, what's interesting is <clears throat> and I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to lead with, with no sugar. It's, it, stands out especially in, in this space uh that said something i always find interesting is how you could see a candy box that says fat free on it and it's like yeah sure but as a ton of sugar sugar converts to fat uh have you found that challenge when how much of a, how how much of a priority is educating consumers about sugar and, and and what it does so they understand what sugar zero sugar means yeah like the ultimate we're up against a lot of challenges but we think yeah. we're riding a wave of education that's happening organically right? right so that's true um otherwise you know we can't do this ourselves like i think that's something that's important when you're starting a product it's unless you've got unless you've got 20 million dollars in your own money that you're ready to pump, pump into educating the consumer like <laughs> Um, hopefully you're riding a trend where somebody else, other people are educating the consumer for you and you can, you know, ride that wave. And, you know, we think we're just at the tip of the iceberg on that. And I think that was a key for us when we started too, is like no sugar was not as big a deal in like 2016, 2017. And then 2018, it really started. People finally started to, to get excited about no sugar. Um, the, and it's just getting bigger and bigger every year. So we, uh, um, what I was going to say, oh, we, get the, we have this challenge where there's, you say no sugar. And then the other problem is everybody else, a lot of the other brands, including Heinz that are riding the no sugar wave, have an artificial sweetener, no sugar version product, right? Either in barbecue sauce or ketchup. Um, and uh, usually it's super low and it tastes terrible and it's bad for you. And so <clears throat> we have that barrier as well that people are going to, we'd love to see that those products are selling really well because it means that the no sugar thing is so big that people are making the accessory sacrifice um, just to be able to buy, you know, that so they're buying the super low products. Um, so we're hoping we can start converting them and say, hey, here's one that doesn't use an artificial sweetener where you're eating apple, carrots, and butternut squash instead. And it tastes much, much better too. So that's mm -hmm. kind of our, our big push on that. Is, that's uh, interesting. Uh, how much of the condiment space is sold directly to consumer versus B two B to you know to to ballparks to restaurants to, to all the different places that that you'll find condiments? Uh, so I think like Amazon's share of ketchup is tiny. Um, I want to say it's like eight million dollars a year or something. No, no it's got to be more than that, but it's a uh, it's pretty small. Um, Amazon's ketchup sales are, are pretty small. Um, it's weird because when we first look at it, we have ketchup, barbecue, and hot sauces. Um, you know, in retail, it's like ketchup is huge, then barbecue, then hot sauces. And in, on Amazon, it was the reverse: is the hot sauces mm. are much bigger than barbecue and ketchup. And I think that's because you know people go to Amazon for fragmented categories where there's a, there's a lot of choice and they want to find something unique. And hot sauces like that, it's a very fragmented category where there's lots of uniqueness and differentiation. And then barbecue sauce is a little bit more like that. And ketchup has never been fragmented. It's always been, you know, it's like private label and Heinz is 90% of the market. Right. Um, and then Hans is the next 8% or something like that. So uh, the so it's, there's no differentiation really or hasn't been for a long time in ketchup. And so, it's, you know, people, why go to Amazon for ketchup, right? When every store has, you would assume if you didn't know about our products, 
every store would has like Heinz and private label, which you assume is the only thing that's available, right? And they're going to have an organic version. And that's usually the only thing people think are the, is the only healthy option if they're not uh, familiar with our products or other um, natural ketchups. So um, online directing consumer is not a huge thing. And that's one of the challenges too, is why, why we went stores first and didn't do online first is one, we were in all in glass bottles to start. And so shipping glass sucks. Um, and Amazon actually wouldn't even let you initially back in 2015, 2016. Um, at first, Amazon wouldn't let you ship food in glass bottles uh, hmm. or sell food in glass bottles because of the breakage risk. So um, they changed that in 2017, I think. Um, if I remember right, but <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons we want to score first too, is like, you know, consumers don't buy our products online and, um, purchasing online, like really only makes sense if you're buying in bulk. And, uh, you know, again, you know, it's, it's a slow term product. So who's buying three bottles, six bottles of ketchup or barbecue sauce at a time. Anyhow. So, right. right so. Um, so very, then again, very difficult to measure repeat sales on your customers because you could sell a case, six bottles of ketchup to a customer and they could be one of your best customers. They could absolutely love the product, but they may not, you may not see a sale from them again for another year, at least, right? Because they just bought six bottles and maybe that lasts them over a year, maybe it lasts yeah. two years. So it's so interesting. So it's a difficult. So what have you found to be effective channels of, of reaching fragmented uh, suburban families. So, um, obviously it's taking us a while, but getting into the right stores. So like key stores and right. suburban markets and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, um, you're doing in-store events like demos and things like that. So pre COVID our biggest marketing, um, what we realized we found before, but the biggest marketing was event based. It was, uh, we would do field marketing events and demos in stores. Um, so we did, we used to, there are gluten-free events all over the country. We do all of those, try to saturate that allergen free, gluten-free market where people are really, cause that's an early adopter consumer that's suburban based usually and kids and they're, um, very hungry for new products and they don't trust any conventional products. And, um, and they're also very active on social media and it's like that. It's a very small community. It's a very small percentage. Um, but you know, if you can get into that community, they will promote your products significantly. Like there's a lot of Facebook groups where they're you know, talking about products all the time, sharing. Um, so we did that. Um, we did, uh, we then discovered fitness events too, which we found were amazing. Um, and even like bodybuilding shows, things like this, um, especially with the no sugar products, the bodybuilders are again, very, you know, they're eating very, um, bland meals most of the time, things like this. And so they're really excited to find some type of sauce that they could use um, that wouldn't throw off their macros, things like this. Um, and um, and they were also very active on social media and promoting the product and things like this. And at the fitness shows, you get dietitians and fitness instructors. Things like so we're trying to find these kinds of um, early brand ambassadors and advocates that we can create a personal connection with um, and, uh, dietitians are another one. So we do dietitian shows and go to places where dietitians are and try to convert dietitians and work with them. So, um, anywhere where we can find brand advocates who are interacting with people, either on social media or in person on a regular basis. And, you know, so that they know and can recommend our products. Um, and that was, that was the key thing that we did all the time. And so it was all about kind of interacting trying to find these people, creating events, creating a memory. Um, and uh, so we found in person things were, you know, just the most important thing we could possibly do. They'll wear you out. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, but that was key. So we did food show, foodie shows, you know, uh, family show, anything family focused, mom focused, um, health focused, fitness focused. Like that was kind of like the, there's a Venn diagram of like family, fitness, food, like, that's actually, we have a t-shirt that says family fitness food for, for made foods because that's like the, our key family thing fitness right food. I like that. Yeah. That's a good saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that, man, that leads into the league side, right? Which is, a, you know, um, why we think hopefully league side will be really great for us is because it's connecting with those suburban families. It's like an in-person kind of not always in-person, but almost in-person as close as you can get um, sampling, getting in front of people, getting connected with them, 
and you know and then them being brand advocates for you afterwards um yeah and uh i i must say the families in these youth sports organizations once they learn more about true made foods they're so excited to have you as a sponsor uh and also excited about the product and uh <laughs> which is just a, a tremendous win-win helping more kids play sports and live healthier lifestyles. So I uh, love how our missions align. Yeah, I know. And I mean, I felt the, the same way, especially as somebody who spends like 90% of my time when I'm not working on roommate foods is I'm driving kids around or dealing with some type of youth sport thing. Um, like it's become my life. I was telling some parents the other day, it's like, I'm not talking about work or kids sports. Like I have nothing to talk about. Like I really feel like I have no conversation topics. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I feel that. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. so, like my kids are, um, you know, my three oldest are just like in serious sports. They're all serious athletes. And they, you know, we, my daughter who's 11 has been in travel soccer for three years now, which is insane to think about at 11 years old. And she has turned 11. So she's in fifth grade. Um, and my mom, my wife has become, her mom has become the team manager for the past two years too. So we're like all in the, the world of soccer. So, and then my wife is throwing acronyms at me like CCL and NCSL, EDP and all this stuff and ODP constantly. And I'm trying to keep track of it all. So many and, acronyms. <laughs> yeah. And I've got, you know, my oldest, my two oldest boys play football um, very competitively and they, you know, they did travel football and AYFL and, now they're going this weekend we're going to be in an fbu baltimore camp and nice like that. And so it's like um yeah so we're always doing these things and doing these events and so we're trying to figure out how to i love and, and what i found too with youth sports is um and this is why we really want to work more with youth sports is there is um a lot of knowledge in the coaches but the coaches about um, training about the sport and about, you know, physical training, about like working out, like they've gotten a lot better, but the coach has gotten really smart about physical training, things like this, and about fitness, things like this. The coaches still don't know anything about nutrition. Um, you know, and they tell, they're constantly telling the kids to eat healthy. They don't know how to tell the kids to eat healthy. And then you go to the events um, and they're selling junk food, you know? So the Friday night food, whether it's the high school or the youth sports, and the snacks that parents bring for the post game, it's like complete junk food um, all the time. And the point where I've like almost like had to try to take over certain things and be like, okay, nobody else is buying food for this event. Like I will just, I'll provide all the food. I promise you, it'll be really, really good. I promise you, you will love it. And but it's not. <laughs> I can't. I, I'm I'm just so sick of like seeing all junk food showing up. Um, yeah. You know, from Gatorade to thinking, you know, okay, seven-year-old kids playing soccer don't need Gatorade. It's like, they don't, they're not, they're not it's not the Tour de France. They don't need a cliff bar and Gatorade. It's like, you know, there's way too much fructose for them. Um, <laughs> so we're, you know, so we think there's, I think there's a great opportunity here to help educate and bring this together. And the kids are doing something about fitness, you know, and it's so important Um and parents are so insane about their kids' sports right now. But nutrition is one thing that they have not, you know, learned to take seriously yet. Um, or they, and then <clears throat> it's not the parent's fault um, or the coach's fault. Like the, the, the material out there is bad. You know, people still go off of the calorie is a calorie thing when it's, it's not. You know, and you think, oh, kids can eat anything because they burn so many calories. And that's not true. Uh, toast, which is... 50% sucrose, table sugar is 50% 50 glucose and 50% fructose. You, you burn glucose, your body burns glucose, but your body can also make glucose out of anything, like um, out of protein and out of the carb. Um, <clears throat> but glucose is a simple sugar. Um, it, if it consumed in too much, it causes, creates fat, um, creates visceral fat. But fructose is the real problem. Um, and fructose is 100 agave, agave syrup, juice, um, corn syrup is 100% fructose and it's not metabolized by the body. Like your body doesn't burn fructose as a calorie. So the calories in fructose don't even count. <clears throat> it's like alcohol it goes right to your liver. So giving a kid a Gatorade is like giving them a beer, basically, except for the, the um, metabolically. It's like exactly like giving them a beer. So it goes right to your liver. 
your liver can't handle, especially the little kid's liver can't handle all that fructose, um, gets overwhelmed. It creates visceral body fat and it spikes insulin. Um, again, people thought because it doesn't spike blood, blood glucose and the reason fructose doesn't spike blood glucose is because it's not getting metabolized. So it's not turning into sugars in your, in your bloodstream that can be burned by your cells. It's going right to your liver and causing, but it still spikes the insulin because your insulin is a hormone that is reacts to be able to handle that, to be able to take care of that sugar. Mm -hmm. Um, so it causes insulin resistance faster than anything else that you're eating. So again, another rabbit hole we could go down, but <laughs> that's yeah, uh, interesting. And, and yeah, like to your point, you're riding a wave of, of education. People are becoming more aware of, you know, just health and, and how, how to be healthy, but there's still so much more room to, to grow that, that, right. that you're seeing at every game that, that you're going to it. Uh, on the weekend. Yeah. So we, I mean, so our communication strategy is, and that's what's key about our product. And I think why we do well is because we, we try to keep it simple. It's like no added sugar, right? So no sugar, people are starting to know that sugar is bad. So no sugar. And I say we more vegetables and veggies instead. Right. And so we're not trying to educate them about nootropics or, um, you know, Ashwandagon or like some other type of weird root or matcha or something like this that, you know, <laughs> most suburban families have never heard of, don't understand the concept of and things like this. And you're like, we're just saying veggies, like everybody knows carrots are good for you, right? Or apple, apples should be good for you, right? right. There is some confusion because apple juice is bad for you, but apples are still really good for you. So like, so like <clears throat> apples, carrots, butternut squash, people understand these are healthy things, tomatoes, like so you should be eating these things and you're, you, so, and you want your kids to eat more of them. Right. Uh, so yeah. that's kind of our, um, uh, that's kind of our, our, our piece right there. Yeah. And, and through the strategy that you found to be effective through the, 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 you know, fitness events, youth sports, sounds like you're finding these micro influencers in each of these communities that will ultimately love the brand and, and, and promote it to, to other uh, health conscious family oriented people in the community. So, yeah. And I hope, you know, we hope the, that the education just keeps getting better and more, you know, people get out there more and they start listening to the doctors who are saying the right thing and the, the, uh, um, the dietitians that are saying the right thing out there. Yeah. about eating whole foods, cutting out sugar. So, um, you know, I think like veganism and plant-based got highly accelerated because, you know, it was like the perfect combination. You had hundreds of millions of VC dollars pouring into these companies um, that then spent it all on PR, right? To pump up, you know, vegan lifestyle and created documentaries and got celebrities on board and everything like this. Um, and the milk and the meat industry were taken totally um, flat-footed because, you know, plant-based meat and plant-based milk have been there, been around forever. And it's always been like 0.1% of the market and they never thought it was this. And then all of a sudden all this money came in, promoted it like crazy, you know, and uh, become a thing. I think it's over-promised, obviously, like, because if you see Beyond Meat's um, share price, right, it's like, I think they went a little bit too far. Yeah. Um, but uh the problem with the sugar, the anti-sugar movement is like, there's no, there's no hundreds of millions, there's not hundreds of millions of dollars coming in promoting anti-sugar or no sugar diets, right? Instead, you have um, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent by the sugar lobby, um, SIA, the sugar industry of America, and, you know, the large corporations for large food co corporations and soda companies for the last 30 years, trying to change the nutrition and change the advice out there, things like this, and buying doctors. And so, we're fighting the oxidant. So all the no sugar movement is completely organic. Um, and so I think we're getting in kind of ground floor, which is always risky because you don't want to be too far ahead. Right. But uh, <clears throat> we're getting ground floor and we just hope we can just keep riding this up at the right point And, you know, as it turns, um, I mean, my theory is in like 10 years, hopefully sooner sugar will be like smoking. Like people will be like, you know, completely turned off by the fact that they'll be looking back at like, the way we look at 1950s movies with doctors smoking and be like, yeah. Well, how did we think that was okay? Smoke. Yeah, exactly. right, right. <laughs> or the fact that you could smoke on an airplane, right? And yeah, that was okay, right? So, 
you know, and, and uh, so hopefully we look back and we're like, God, we gave kids so much sugar. Like, what were we thinking? And hopefully, you know, that changes sooner rather than later. But yeah, that's what we're trying to. I think anything you're doing from a marketing perspective, you need to try to make sure you're riding that trend because if you're not, if there's not a, a mass awakening or movement happening around you, if you're not part of some type of wave, then you are, <laughs> you're battling alone out there. And it's, that's a really, really hard, hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, create your own education. And unless you get like some Silicon Valley investor, you give you hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> <pump it all. laughs> PR. So. Which we'll take, right? If right. any, if any Silicon Valley investors out there. Well, Abe, this has been so much fun having you on the show. Uh, again, absolutely love what you're building. It's delicious. It's sugar free. There's vegetables. These are good things. We all do. We, we all need to be uh, consuming healthier products, especially in this country. Uh, and you're making it possible. So before I let you go, we've got one last section of, of uh, the show. It's called the lightning round. So I've got four questions for you and two minutes total to answer all, answer all four. So first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. All right. First question. First, what is your favorite youth sports memory? Uh, my favorite youth sports memory or my most uh, compelling? Uh, I have my favorite, my favorite youth sports memory, uh, eighth grade basketball finals in this thing where we're playing for the final championship thing and uh, in my middle school basketball team. And um, I had just exploded in growth and I could jump like crazy. I could grab rim at 13 years old. And I was chasing down guys on fast breaks and blocking the ball up against the rim, things like this. And that was my greatest memory. So I got called every time I did that, I got a foul called on me, but it was so, so upset. It was just the most emotional thing. So it was like one of the greatest moments ever of like exploding as an athlete, all of a sudden, like turning the corner as an athlete. And then like the ref just screwing you over. Uh, so, but um, what, when you were uh, a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be an astronaut. Nice. What is a brand whose marketing you admire most? Uh, Nike, by far. Like, I think they're just like the best. Uh, so. and, and finally, what is a go-to cause that you like to support? There's a lot of them out there. Um, I think right now the one that comes to mind most is the parkland shooting victim thing. Yeah. Well, Abe, thank you for your service. Thank you for more than thank you for servicing all of us with delicious food that is healthy. Uh, and you know, we're, we're cheering for you and, uh, just wishing you the best of luck. And, and I can't wait until everyone is, ref is refreshing their condiment, uh, cabinet with, with everything's true made foods. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing what you're doing too. Helping us out and like, you know, gardening family, helping families, helping kids, helping youth sports. So, so important. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Wingren podcast with Abe Kmark. As a recap, we discussed go to market strategy, marketing strategy, and health trends, and specifically the negative effects of sugar. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Evan Brandoff. See you next time, everyone. Play on. Thank you for joining this episode of the Win Grin Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and leave a rating at leagueside.com slash podcast. For more educational and inspiring content, you can follow Leagueside on LinkedIn and Instagram at leagueside underscore. See you next time.